Hello and greetings from sunny Dublin. Good afternoon, good evening, or good morning, wherever you may be. My name is Kieran Talley and I lead KPMG's Applied Intelligence Practice. And by Applied Intelligence, I mean the practice that houses our data engineering, data science, machine learning, and AI capability. And it's an area that I've been working in all my professional life over 20 plus years. Uh, and you know, one of the fascinating things for me is actually to watch the meteoric growth of AI and machine learning capability over the length of time that I've been working with both um, global and domestic public and private companies. Um, I'm showing, showcasing here just a few bullet points I took from the Artificial Intelligence Index, um, a, a, it's a global snapshot, I suppose, of the health of the AI industry and community across the world. And it's a very interesting uh, resource for anyone out there that isn't familiar with it to go and have a look. I'm not going to spend any time here talking about um, you know, the, the growth of, uh, of AI. I'm sure because of the, the audience that we have here that everyone will be very much aware uh, and be deeply immersed in this industry. I'm going to spend more of my time thinking about, well, you know, what are the, the concerns? What are, what are the issues that are stopping us from scaling AI or getting our AI capabilities to an enterprise-wide level? Uh, and my argument is going to be that it's fundamentally based on trust. And from working with over, for over 20 years in this industry, um, I know that leaders maybe not always be uh, extremely data literate, but they do have uh, questions around, around their data and their capability. And when they don't understand or they have, uh, they see some of the, the, the cases that make it onto the public stage of where AI goes wrong, uh, and they feel that they don't understand, that is, that is an issue. That's preventing what's, what, our, our ability to scale. It, it gives rise to terms as fintech fatigue or getting punch drunk on POCs. Um, lots and lots of trials, but very little being done at scale. Uh, I want to talk about some of those concerns at the minute. The, the concerns um, are around the use of which we're putting AI to. So, if you look at um, uh, an organization called Tech Won't Build It, it is a, a group of IT professionals um, who come together with very much an ethical view on the application of AI and say, well, we don't want to be involved in work that is damaging to society or humanity. And you'll see some examples up here, and you've probably heard some of those in the news as well, uh, of where you know, these AI engineers uh, and scientists, you know, ones that are not Luddites, they're not going to be the ones that are out of work um, as, as AI scale. They're the ones that are benefiting mostly from it. But they recognize the power of the tool. Um, and they're calling into question how we are proposing to, to govern and put an ethical framework around that capability. So I think that is interesting. And, and coupled with that, you also have uh, you know, the growth of, of the data and AI companies. And um, Amy Webb from uh, New York has written a book called The Big Nine, where she identifies five US companies and four Chinese companies that are essentially almost dominating the productive power um, of, of, of data and AI capabilities. And I'm sure, you know, all of you here on this call would probably be able to list off um, almost all nine out of, uh, out of nine. So you know that that is a concern, um, particularly when you see that uh, the resources required to be at the leading edge uh, are so demanding now that they're shutting out a lot of small businesses, universities, etc. So if I take a, a a paper called Green AI, which was uh, published by University of Washington, uh, Carnegie Mellon, um, and the Allen Institute in Seattle. You know, they show that we're, what was cutting edge um, just a few years ago, now to be at the cutting edge, it, it takes 300,000 X the compute power um, in order to, to, to be right there at that cutting edge. Now, most of us are aware of that cost in terms of financial costs. If you try and do something, uh, you'll probably hit your, your, your barrier within your organization. We need to think about it uh, more wider than that because 
the global ICT industry is projected to use 20% of all the world's electricity uh, by 2025, um, outputting about 14% of uh, carbon dioxide, which is greater than the aviation industry um, and greater even than Japan, which is uh, number five in the list of, sort of global polluters. And so much of that has been driven by, by the pursuit of accuracy. So we're going to get more and more and more accurate uh, AI capability. Very little has been thought has been given to um, efficiency um, or how to do you know, more with less. So if we look at um, that same paper on green AI, the, the authors looked at the, some of the three major AI conferences uh, and just started to, to uh, understand you know, what was the, the pursuit. It was mostly accuracy, efficiency, or both. And as you can see, you know, accuracy is what, is what dominates. And I think that's, that's too simplistic a metric for us to be um, concerned about now. Well, obviously, everyone wants um, their models to be accurate, but we need to start thinking of some other metrics, some of which I was, I was just talking about there. But other concerns obviously to do with, with data and you know we've seen things like Cambridge Analytica um, appear in the media which actually gives, uh, gives the wider public sort of a very very bad taste in their mouth. But when you look at um, some of the data that's actually captured and available out there on individuals particularly uh, I suppose more in the US rather than in Europe where we've got GDPR protections. Um, if you look at uh, where journalists uncovered you know, telco data on millions and millions and millions of US users. And they just picked a few uh, locations, in this case happens to be the White House, uh, and shows where um, all, the, all those mobile phones were and how, how they could move over the day. So, you know, questions around privacy, but also, you know, this, when, you, when you look at places like the White House and another one they looked at, the Pentagon, you know, there's probably questions there around security as well as everything else. But it's not just how the, you know, what data is being collected, but it's how, how we're using some of that, that AI. And if you take the time that, that Trump looked to leave the Paris Accords, and I was tweeting about that, you know, the Guardian found that almost a quarter, over 25% of all the, the retweets were actually generated by bots. So when we see these kind of cases, and we've heard the discussions about, um, you know, Propaganda and fake news and Facebook, etc. You know, these, these all call into mind questions of, of trust uh, with the public. And just to you know, focus also on on the data piece. Um, so I think it's always most interesting. It's very helpful to try and explain to industry, you know, on what what data and what what use cases uh, you're building your capability. Because the guys at uh, MIT. Um, did a little experiment just to highlight the importance of data and to the, the correct data. And they built Norman, which they call the first psychopathic AI. And the way they did that is they, they took um, a series of Rorschach tests uh, and went to um, Microsoft's Cocoa repository, um, which basically is, let's say, standard normal human beings interpretation of a Rorschach test. And then they also went to a subreddit um, within Reddit that was looking at uh, death and suicide and you know very unsavory things like that, and then just presented um, data to to the system. So if they presented this example, the standard AI, it sees you know a group of birds sitting on top of a tree branch, which is you know I think seems reasonable when you look at that, but on the same data, when you ask Norman, so the man was electrocuted and catches to, to death. Um, so it's, you know, it's just maybe an amusing little aside, but we've seen many, many cases where the data on which our AI has been built um, kind of narrows in its, its application. There are many other examples I'm sure you can all come across. But these are all, all issues that we need to be concerned about. Um, and what it says to me is that we need a much more multidisciplinary approach um, and we need more metrics in which to judge our success. But fundamentally, we need to bridge that trust gap. And if I use uh, the sort of the famous um, David Meister equation, the trust equation, 
he would say trustworthiness is a combination of credibility, reliability, and intimacy divided by self-orientation. And just to explain some of those terms, by credibility, it means, you know, do they know what they're talking about? And if I take this to, let's say, the medical industry, um, so when we think about doctors, we know that doctors have gone through, you know, seven plus years of education, have been tested many, many times, are constantly monitored. Um, so their, their credibility in our eyes is, is really high. They've spent a lot of time uh, building up that cred credibility. So we don't have to know so much about diseases, COVID-19 is of this world, but we, we trust that they are uh, credible when it comes to tackling it. Reliability is, you know, do they deliver on their promises? Um, obviously credibility and reliability uh, are very easy for us to understand from that point of view, you know, uh, in terms of higher credibility or the higher your, your reliability, the more trust you have. Intimacy is your ability to keep things confidential and, you know, the, the doctor-patient relationship is almost sacrosanct in, in that regard. So, you know, that ability to trust that your data is being properly used, um, I think is fundamental. Um, but what brings it all down then is self-orientation. So by self-orientation is, it's the what's in it for me piece. Um, so when you see situations like a, a doctor, you think, you know, they're actually bound by their Hippocratic oath. Their orientation is towards helping you. When you hear, and if I take the example now in the AI and data side, when you hear things like um, the Cambridge Analytica situation, or you hear where your data has been used for purposes other than, than what you'd signed up to, you know, the level of trust, particularly in, in the ICT and AI industry, is quite low, mostly because of this self-orientation uh, aspect, I believe, because we can see that there's a, there's a rush to create this capability and almost dominate this capability um, by certain companies and maybe going again back to that big nine. Uh, and and, and th these are issues that we're going to need to solve if we're going to see more global um, adoption of AI. And uh, it's sort of well recognized um, by CEOs and by uh, you know, leaders in, in, public, in public services. Um, you know, trust is fundamental. And how are we going to get to that level of trust. Um, you know, I was just say there, the era of self-regulation is over. Time to have a sheriff in town. And in the EU, you know, there are there are working groups that are very much focused on uh, on AI for good and how to govern and manage AI, as there are in, in the US. And what I uh, what I want to contribute is that I think that what we need to start thinking about now is less of that POC culture, less of that um, build it and see will it work culture, but actually think more about how am I going to scale from the start? And if I'm going to scale from the start, I need to build up uh, the trust. And I think the, the areas of trust are around resilience, integrity, explainability, and fairness. And I imagine others uh, in this conference are going to be talking about explainability and fairness uh, resilience and integrity, and I won't spend much time on it here. But essentially, what I'm saying is, we, we need a framework whereby we can have a set of KPIs and a set of metrics that allows us to understand both the data and the development of our AI capabilities and how it's actually used in the real world. And that that framework and that monitoring and that that control that we put around AI. That's what's going to build the level of trust because now a business leader or a public services leader can understand not only how we have developed this capability, but where it will work, but also that it's not just a black box and that we're actually monitoring and understanding what's going on and we're able to act or in intervene um, before things get out of hand. So let me leave you on that point. I think the key issue, as I said, is, is trust. Trust is what's well, going to help us to scale. And we can actually measure trust in many different ways. We need to spend some time actually focusing on that, both the data and the capability.